to the morning service of Big Springs Community Church. We're glad that we are all here on this beautiful fall day. God summons his people to worship every Lord's Day, every first day of the week. He summons us to worship this day with his words, Jesus' words. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true, blood, uh, true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. People of God, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. God greets us and welcomes us into his presence with his words. To all those in Big Springs, community church who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever merciful, ever gracious God, since all our salvation depends upon your holy word, therefore grant our hearts and minds that they may be set free from our worldly things so that we may with all diligence and attention and faith hear your word, rightly understand your gracious will, worship you acceptably in spirit and in truth, and in all sincerity live according to the same, to your praise and glory through our Lord Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, dwelling in heaven forever and ever. Amen. Let us remain standing and sing number 213, Glory Be to God the Father. We will sing verses 2, 3, and 4. summary of the first table of the Ten Commandments and then a summary of the second table of the Ten Commandments. God's law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. 
Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandments are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So we know that uh, we uh, violate uh, you know, these laws, whether it's in our hearts or minds, or in our actions, or in our words. We violate God's law daily. So we are uh, to confess, repent of our sins. So let us pray. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts. Cleanse us from all our offenses. Deliver us from our proud thoughts and vain desires, that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our sins, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength in trouble. Through Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. So we have um, one um, prayer item here for uh, Ricky. Ricky Metcalf, uh, Ronnie also, um, I lost um, the mother this week, uh, the mother is Teresa McCall, okay, so uh, let us uh, pray for comfort for, for them. Let us come to God's throne of grace. Almighty Sovereign Lord and Creator of the universe, as we uh, gaze at the beauty around our church and homes this early fall, we are reminded that we are to uh, give you thanks for all the things you have provided for us, that we are to pray for our own church, for our board and pastor, that uh, they would administer the church wisely and humbly, gently with strength, with compassion and with knowledge. We pray for our congregation that you would heal and strengthen our members both in body and spirit. And we pray if it's your will that we also grow in number from our own community. We pray uh, for your church, uh, church worldwide that uh, you may preserve her, protect her from uh, their enemies uh, we pray for comfort uh, and perseverance for those who are persecuted for your name's sake. Uh, we pray that they may hope uh, in your Son, Jesus Christ, alone. We pray also that you would give us always a spirit of unity in one faith, one Lord, one God, and one Spirit. Uh, that we would desire Christ above all the idols of our surroundings that we would seek to please Him above any other, that we would lead our homes in serving You, that we would persevere in the faith, for You call us to serve and fear all the days of our lives. O Sovereign Lord, we pray for uh, the federal, state, and local officials, for our police and armed forces, for our justices and judges. So we pray that they would govern according to your laws, uh, even if they don't know you, and with a love for righteousness and holiness in the midst of all lawlessness, disunity, untruthfulness, and dishonesty around us. We pray especially for those who have lost loved ones or homes and other properties in Florida, that they may have hope in this disaster that you have sent our way, that they would come to you in repentance and faith as their only refuge and strength 
in their time of trouble. O merciful Lord, God and Father of all comfort, our only help in time of need, we commend to you all those who are suffering or distressed or grieving in mind and body. We also pray for the poor, for the jobless, for the homeless among us. We pray especially today for uh, Earl, uh, for uh, Leo, for Anita, for Cecilia. Uh, we pray for healing, uh, for uh, Anita, for her uh, uh, rib uh, fractures, for Cecilia, for her fractures uh, in her uh, vertebrae. Uh, we pray for Earl as uh, um, to uh, be relieved of his pain. Uh, we also pray, uh, pray especially today for um, Ricky Metcalf and, and Ronnie as uh, they have lost their mother, Teresa McCall. Give them, as they grieve, give them hope uh, that they may, um, they will see her uh, in glory uh, if they have uh, faith and repentance of their sins, faith in Christ and his resurrection. We especially pray today for uh, Hardy <coughs> as uh, he had a, um, a, a mild uh, AFib and uh, that uh, we thank you that he was able to recover and we thank you for the doctors and uh, the uh, surgeons or the medicines that are being administered to him. Uh, we praise you that he has come out of this um, in, uh, uh, without anything else. Uh, we pray that you, uh, you would continue to heal him in the days and weeks and months uh, to come. We pray here our prayer, O Lord, give uh, ear to our pleas for mercy, and in your faithfulness answer us in your righteousness according to your sovereign will alone. For we ask them in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our offerings today uh, will be for the general fund. From First Chronicles 16.29, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. So let us remember that uh, thanksgivings and offerings are part of our worship services. Let us now stand and sing, uh, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, we will sing the first four stanzas. <laughs>
our scripture readings, uh, we will um, leave uh, our studies of the kings and people of Israel, and um, well, we will uh, study some something that's related to uh, our current events uh, this this morning. So I will read uh, from Amos chapter three, and then Luke thirteen and then Romans 8. So Amos uh, chapter 3, beginning with verse 1, the word of the Lord. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to me? Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion cry out from his den if he has taken nothing? Does a bird fall in a snare on the earth? When there is no trap for it, does a snare spring up from the ground when it has taken nothing? Is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants and prophets. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? Proclaim to the strongholds in Ashdod, and to the, uh, so only to, uh, up to verse 8. And then we'll go to uh, Luke 13, uh, verses 1 to 9. The word of the Lord. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those eighteen on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So I'll uh, stop there, up to verse 5 only, and then we'll go to uh, Romans 8. Romans 8, beginning with verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is re revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. Verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. Thus far the reading of God's most holy and inerrant word. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Beloved congregation of Christ, 
as uh, Hurricane Ian was barreling down on Florida last week. A CNN host asked the, the acting director of the National Hurricane Center how climate change affects the strength of hurricanes. But the director rebuffed him, saying, I don't think you can link climate change to any one event. On the whole, on the cumulative, climate change may be making storms worse. But to, to link any one event, I would caution against that. Every hurricane says, uh, season, climate change proponents always say that hurricanes are getting stronger because of climate change. But is this true? So let us look at the historical records. The strongest hurricane uh, in, in record in terms of landfall winds uh, speed was hu uh, Hurricane Keys in what year? 1935, with maximum winds of 185 miles an hour. In recent memory, the strongest hurricanes are Camille in 1965, 175 mph, Carla in 1961, 170, Andrew in 1992, 165. How does Hurricane Ian last week compare with these and other hurricanes in history? Ian has a style at sixth place with eight other hurricanes at 150 miles per hour. Four of these hurricanes came in what years? 1880, 1856, 1884, 1919, and 1932. And in 1928, Hurricane Okeechobee had 145 mile an hour winds. Therefore, are hurricanes getting stronger because of climate change? Absolutely not. These so-called experts are always wrong because they are pagan unbelievers who believe that man, not God, controls the world's climate. Most Christians agree that God is the sovereign, uh, the only sovereign over the universe, declaring from eternity past, the end from the beginning, I will accomplish my purpose, God says. But many ask, is God really not resp uh, responsible for disasters? And if so, does He send them to punish bad people? Our text in Amos answers the first question with a resounding no. When disasters come, God is the only one, is the only one who sends them. Verse 6. Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? Amos was a prophet in the 8th century BC, a time of prosperity and complacency in the two kingdoms uh, of uh, the Israelites, the two nations, uh, Southern Kingdom and the Northern Kingdom. But it was also during the time, that time that the Assyrian Empire was on the rise and was threatening the two nations. The Lord sent Amos to the people to warn them that judgment is coming because of their many sins, including idolatry, sexual immorality, and injustice against the poor to become rich. The answer to the second question, does he send them to punish bad people? This is found in our reading in Luke 13, where Jesus rebukes those who said that those who were killed in the Tower of Siloam, uh, when the Tower of Siloam fell, were worse sinners than them. Instead, he warns the self-righteous Pharisees to repent of their sins or else perish under God's judgment. But Amos' last words in chapter 3 also paint a picture of God's judgment 
on Israel as the destruction of the beautiful and ostentatious houses of the rich. This Lord's Day, so our theme is, did disaster come to Florida unless the Lord has done it under four headings? And the four headings are in our sermon notes. So firstly, the Lord does nothing without revealing His secret. God in His providence is always involved in its affairs. He preserves it, He governs it, and He causes all His creatures to act precisely so that His will is done. And this is why Article 13 of the Belgian Confession, uh, when it quotes Amos 3.8 says, He rules and governs them according to His holy will, so that nothing happens in this world without His appointment. God continuously upholds His creation, and creation only endures through His preservation. He controls the horses of the sun and the moon. He calls each one of the billions of stars by name and directs each lightning's target. From the story of Job, we see that Satan also causes Akan sent disasters because he sent uh, brigands, fire, storm, and disease to take away the health, the wealth, and the children of Job, a righteous man. But he can do so only by God's consent and within limits set by God. Can we know whether or to what extent the devil's hand was involved in Hurricane Ian? No, we, we cannot. What we know is that God is sovereign over all things, both good and evil, because they are revealed to us in His inerrant word. And this is what Amos 3 verses 7 and 8 says, For the Lord God does nothing without revealing His secret to His servants, the prophets. So he illustrates this, this truth with uh, a few examples, with a lion. When we hear the roar of a lion, we know that he has found and killed a prey. Uh, in a series of questions in verses 3 to 6, demonstrate that the, uh, the outcome of certain events are predictable. A bird doesn't fall from heaven without any cause. A snare just doesn't just spring from the ground if an animal is not trapped. So the Lord uses prophets like Amos to sound the alarm. And his message is still God's word today. Judgment day is coming upon all unrepentant sinners in the world. So secondly, do you think that they were worse sinners? This is the question of the Pharisees to Jesus. This was what Jesus uh, was uh, told the Jews in our Luke 13 reading. They told Jesus about the abominable deed that Pilate did when he killed Galileans and then mixed their blood with the blood of animal sacrifices in the temple. That was a a blasphemous, horrible action by Herod, uh, by uh, Pilate. Knowing what was in their minds, Jesus asked them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Jesus then gave them his own example. Eighteen people died when the tower near uh, the pool of Siloam fell on them. Then he asked the Jews the same question. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? Jesus rebuked the Jews for connecting disasters and personal sufferings uh, to, to those whose sin sins are serious. They were all sinners because all have sinned before a God and fall short of God's law. No one is exempted. 
This is what he told also his disciples in John 9, when they asked him if a man who was born blind because of his sin or his parents' sin. The Pharisees as well believed that he was born in utter sin, the man born blind. Jesus answered that the man was not born blind because of his or his parents' sin. He was not a worse sinner than they were. But he says, unless one repents of his sin, he will perish in eternal hell. What does this tell us today in the aftermath of the death and destruction by Hurricane Aeon? Uh, first, as Jesus warned the Jews, we are not better than anyone else if we do not repent. We will perish in hell just like everyone else who do not believe in Christ and repent of his sin. It could have been me or you in the path of hurricanes, the hurricanes, 150 mile an hour winds, and God will still be just in doing so. Second, since we are all sinners, none of us are good. And so when disasters and sufferings come to us, we must not ask, why do bad things happen to good people? Because there are no good people in the sight of God. No, both good things and bad things happen to all people. And all people, people are sinners in the sight of God. All the bad things that happen in this world, evil, disasters, and sufferings, are the result of Adam's sin and of course our own sin. Third, mere creatures like us have no understanding of what God is doing in the world except for what in what He reveals in His Holy Scriptures. We are far from being able to judge whether He is just or unjust, good or bad, or playing favorites. God is the only one in the universe who perfectly understands what in the world is happening because He had decreed everything that will come to pass from eternity past. Third, when all things do not work together for good. So all things that God de uh, decreed are for His own glory. All of God's creation including man himself exists so they will glorify God. So even disasters, sufferings, and evil are for his glory, but subservient to the glorious purpose of his will is his purpose for his people to work all things for their good, for their own good. So Noah's flood and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah were for all mankind to glorify not only his justice and righteousness, but also his grace and mercy for saving his own chosen people. The disaster in the Tower of Siloam happened so that some people will repent of their sin. Jesus gave sight to the man born blind because he says in John 9, 3 that the works of God might be displayed in him. Christians must always have in mind the powerful and assuring words of Romans 8, 28 whenever disaster, suffering, and evil come into their lives. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So this verse beautifully demonstrates to Christians the doctrine of God's sovereign providential care of his people and all creation. God brings all things together into a beautiful salvation plan, even good out of evil, restoration from destruction, joy out of suffering, light out of darkness. What about those who have lost everything, including family members, 
to the winds and the floods of Hurricane Ian? How would they see the glory of God and the beauty of God's sovereignty over this destruction? Their lives have been changed by this disaster for the next several years, maybe for the rest of their lives. Where is the beauty in the heap of rubble that used to be their homes? Where is God's beautiful purpose as they bury their dead? There is only grief, fear, hopelessness, anger, bitterness, and all other kinds of bad emotions. But out of all this, God is working all things for the good of His people. Most often, we do not see this good at the moment. All we see are, uh, are all the sufferings. But behind God's frowning providence is a beautiful plan of salvation and restoration. A plan that is now revealed to us in scriptures, but seems to be hidden because of all of his sufferings. Paul exhorts us to rejoice in all circumstances and be thankful. And this knowledge that God works all things for our good is the basis of this joy and thankfulness, even in sufferings, even when uh, what we are experiencing at this moment does, does not seem to be working out for our good. And then lastly, Amos prophesies, and the great houses shall come to an end. So for those who do not love God, those who are not called according to His purpose, things do not work out for good, ultimately. Evildoers may prosper in this world, and everything may be good for them today. But in the end, what counts forever, none of their prosperity will work out for their own good. They will turn out to be for their destruction because they did not repent. So Amos chapter 3 is a prophecy of God's judgment on all Israelites. The whole nation was plundered by their enemies. No one was spared except for a remnant who were taken into an oppressive captivity. The rest of God's people perished because they did not repent of their sins. The Lord says in verse 15, I will strike the winter house along with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall come to an end. Their prosperity will end in a disastrous defeat at the hands of Gentile kings. Israel's destruction and other great disasters in the Bible are only warnings of the greatest disaster that will befall the whole unrepentant world on Judgment Day. All of God's judgments in the past, Noah's flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, these are all mere portents or foretastes of the most terrible of all judgments. Just as the people of Sodom, all those wicked, unjust people who plunder billions and amass their houses of ivory in foreign lands on the backs of people groaning under the weight of poverty will also be burned in hell. And the world today is spinning towards that day of judgment. All hurricanes and great earthquakes are all mere foretastes of that terrifying day of the Lord. But we are not to speculate that the world, <coughs> at the end of the world, is near around the corner. We are not to say either that the return of Christ is not near. We do not, and we cannot know. What are we to do in the face of this disaster is to repent of our sins, humble ourselves before God, and prepare our hearts to meet God. It could be today, 
or whenever Christ returns. Beloved brothers and sisters, be not terrified at this prospect. Although things do not seem to be working out for good, and sufferings and evils seem to prevail over righteousness, God is still true to His Word. Romans 8.28 is always true, because it is God's Word. How is God able to work all things out for your good? He has used the most terrible evil deed in all of history to bring about His eternal salvation plan, the crucifixion, the unjust crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Jews and the Romans who crucified Him were part of this salvation plan. You are part of this plan, but having contributed nothing except for sin, and your part of this plan is your salvation by His grace and mercy. No place on earth is safe. In these disasters, many find safety in evacuation centers. But ultimately, the only safe place in the world is God, who is our refuge, strength, and salvation. But we still wait for our final redemption. So right now, we must weep with those who weep, mourn with those who mourn. Pray for the salvation of men, that this disaster will be a blessing in disguise. Because God can use anything, good or evil, to save many. Pray that God will use this disaster for people to come to faith in Christ and repent of their sin. For He Himself willingly went to the cross as a sacrifice for all the sins of those who repent and believe in Him as Savior. Let us pray. Almighty and ever lo loving uh, God, we most heartily thank you. You have fed us, you have rightly, uh, who have rightly received this holy sacrament with the spiritual food of this most precious body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. You assure us by this bread and wine of your favor and goodness toward us, that we are members of the body of your Son which is the blessed company of all faithful people. You have made us heirs of your everlasting kingdom by the merits of the most precious passion and death of your dear Son. And we most humbly pray, O Heavenly Father, assist us with your grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as you have prepared for us to walk in. We humbly bend our knees and bow to you, O Sovereign Lord, for you are our Creator, and you uphold and preserve your creation. You know, uh, we know that you sent both blessings and disasters, but we also know that you work all things for the good of your people. Help us now to rejoice and be thankful in whatever <clears throat> circumstances you place us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen.
Now receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His face upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.